Wow. <laughs> I was going to say, Scott's just left me quite speechless, but let's hope that's not the case. I'm to do what I'm about to do. It's probably a cliche when we say, you know, to do something like this is a real privilege, but it is my absolute privilege and, and honour to be speaking to you this evening because Scott is right. The first time I came to HypnoThoughts, nobody knew me. And in fact, the only person that I knew vaguely was my good friend, Stephanie. And I came to HypnoThoughts hoping that I might learn some cool techniques. I would meet some really wonderful people and I could take that back to England and use it within my practice. What I actually found was my home, my hypnotic home. And and what we have in this room is not only some of the world's best hypnosis educators, but we have our community. And that community is the thing that allows you to become something within, within hypnothoughts. What is in this room is people that will fire your imagination and inspire you. There are people here that will believe in you when you don't even quite believe in yourself, which was certainly what I found when I arrived here. And as you can see, we'll celebrate your success. But, but what's more, this is the place where you're given opportunities. And if you're willing and you're courageous enough to take those opportunities, then the world hypnotically truly is your oyster. So let me talk to you a little bit about self-belief. Because one of the things that definitely doesn't happen here at HypnoThoughts is faking it until you make it. And as a woman who works a lot with anorgasmia, we all know that faking it really doesn't help people there. <laughs> and there's a big difference between faking it until you make it and believing it until you achieve it. And the way I kind of look at this is that one of them, faking it, clips your wings, and the other one, believing it until you achieve it, they'll, that, that's how you spread your wings and soar to new heights. <laughs> and the difference between those two, and why faking it till you make it is bad, is actually something I learned when I was very little, when I was actually learning how to read. And for those of you who know me will have seen my kind of Facebook kind of posts and stuff and will see the utterly hilarious spelling mistakes that appear on there from time to time. But that's actually because I'm dyslexic. But I didn't know that until I was 25. So when I was young and I was at school and started to learn how to read, what I actually did was I faked it so nobody would know that I couldn't actually do it. And what I did was I listened to every other child in the class. So I, there was 31 children in my class, and I was 28th reader every week, and I would listen to all the other children and memorize the book of that week. And when it came to my turn, I kind of go up and read to the teacher, and I would just kind of recite what I'd learned that morning by listening to all the other children. And this worked well for me for a whole year until the day the teacher decided to do the list in reverse order. And that time I was third. And as you can imagine, that didn't work out so well. So that night I went home and I kind of fessed up, I confessed to my mother what had happened. And luckily my mum realised that actually what I got a good skill was for memory and I just hadn't connected it to the words. And she bought me something called Storyteller. I don't know if you have those every day where you get a magazine and you set, you would listen to the cassette and follow the words along in the book. And that was how I learned to read. And actually I became an avid reader, so much so that I got to a point in my life where I would read under the bedclothes with a torch when I was supposed to be asleep. And one night my old mum, who uh, came home from work early, she was a nurse, 
and caught me doing this, reading under the bedclothes with a torch. And kind of, I, I knew this when the duvet was drawn off, and she was kind of looking at me. And I realised, thinking I was going to get into trouble, that actually she was smiling. And of course, I was doing the very thing that, you know, I, I once didn't believe that I could do. So no longer was I faking reading, I was actually believing that I could and doing it every single night up in bed. And she said to me, Kazi, what are you reading? And I said, Mum, I'm reading Peter Pan. And she looked at me and she said, Oh, you're reading the family story. And I looked at her and said, What do you mean, Mum, the family story? And she said, Kazi, tell me, what's my name? And I kind of looked at her and I said, well, it's Mum. <laughs> and she said, no. She said, what does Dad call me? And I said, Wendy. And she said, uh, and what's my Mum and Dad's name? And I said, Grandma and Granddad Barry. And she said, so before I married Dad, my name was Wendy Barry. Now then, she said, who wrote this book? I turned the pages back and I looked. And I said, J.M. Barry. She said, now do you believe you can fly? <laughs> so I said to my mum, so who is he? And she said, he's our great, great uncle. Then, of course, I said, well, does that mean we're rich? <laughs> she said, no. <laughs> and for those of you that don't know, all the royalties of Peter Pan actually go to Great Ormond Street Hospital um, and will do forever. There's a, there was a law that was passed to, to make sure that that happens. But, you know, if you're J.N. Murray's great, great, great niece, then you have to fly. You can't fake it. You have to get on and do it. You have to believe in a bit of magic. So that's really where I first learned to kind of have some self-belief. Not to fake it until I make it, but to believe it until I achieve it. And, you know, just a, a really wonderful way of, of, of learning that story when I was younger. And there is actually a quote in that book, in, in the book Peter Pan, which is simply this. As soon as you endow your ability to fly, you lose forever the ability to do it. And that for me is really very much about what Hypno Thoughts brought to me, was it made me believe I could fly. I was there, I was, I was doing fine, I was a, a hypnotist, I got a full clinic, I'd been in practice for 10 years, and when I arrived at Hypno Thoughts, it had never occurred to me that I should be teaching Never once had I thought I should be teaching the stuff that I do with my clients. And it's only through the people that I've worked with, my, you know, other first timers like Stephanie and Sheila, who literally sat me down and said, you need to come back here next year and teach this stuff. So thank you. Now the other thing that J.M. Barry did was he didn't, he just didn't care what other people thought. He really didn't. He would do things um, not caring what other people thought. One of them was he put a statue of Peter Pan in Kensington Gardens. And at that time, all the kind of hoi polloi, all the rich people in London were like, look at him putting a, he's not even dead yet, and he's putting a statue in there. What do you think he's doing? But his intention for doing that was actually to, so that the children could go and they could use their imaginations, they could be inspired, they could kind of play around at the feet of Peter Pan and kind of get lost in this world of imagination and inspiration. And he didn't care what the other people thought. Now, interestingly, all those old kind of uh, attitudes and beliefs about what J.M. Barry did have gone, but that statue is still there today. And children still play at the feet of Peter Pan at that fountain, you know, every single day. So it just goes to show, you know, what other people think truly doesn't matter, does it? 
The other thing that Jay and Barry did, which I'll talk a bit more about in a minute, was he actually took on the censors who um, were trying to govern playwrights so that they kept everything proper and, you know, kind of well censored. And uh, as some of you may know, I had a, my own battle with the censors quite recently, but we'll come to that in just a moment. So hypnotically, you can imagine, if you're J.M. Barry's great-great-great-niece and your Wendy's daughter, the idea of hypnosis and doing things kind of magically and with a bit of inspiration came quite naturally for me. And the first time I actually hypnotised anybody, I was 10 years old, and I hypnotised my sister. And believe it or not, I was inspired by the evil clown episode of Scooby-Doo. <laughs> So with that kind of combination of fairy stories and Scooby-Doo, my, my younger sister used to get very kind of, um, well, scared at night. She had a lot of nightmares. And I literally tied one end of a scarf to her bed and the other to mine, and then I said these words to her. As you go to sleep and close your eyes, all the bad feelings will travel down the scarf from your bed into mine, and you'll sleep soundly till morning. That's the first ever hypnotic words I ever spoke. <laughs> You'd be pleased to hear I got better training after that. <laughs> I actually trained with the London College of Clinical Hypnosis, and this is where my journey of meeting some of the best mentors prior to coming to HypnoThoughts were there. I had two really amazing mentors, um, in my early days of hypnosis, and it's like anything, you don't realise how amazing something was until you don't have it anymore. My first mentor was a real unsung hero of hypnosis. His name was Maurice Sterndale. He was based up in, uh, in Oldham, which is a very northern part of the UK. He had a, a northern British accent that was even more northern than mine. And he taught, he had some really interesting ways of doing things. Um, his way of teaching me fractionation was to, tell, was to say literally this, send them up and down into hypnosis more time to the bride's night or their wedding night. <laughs> Which was kind of an interesting way to describe fractionation, but that's what he did. He was amazing. He used to take me out on home visits. He used to um, truly just kind of allow me to see a part of hypnosis that I didn't realise is not a normal thing when people first start out. They're not normally taken out to see clients, to see hypnosis in action, which is what he did for me. Um, and my other mentor was a lady called Anna Zephorian, who was a Russian hypnotist. She was also an MD um, and used to love hypnotising uh, male uh, medical students to get them to do interesting things. <laughs> Now, her, her trademark was stiletto heels and an Armani suit. And between them, they used to have me record my sessions and send them into them, where they would then make me sit and justify every single thing that I did with every single client. Literally, word by word. And although I hated it, it used to terrify me. I am so grateful because anybody that's trained with me now knows and will hear regularly, what do you hear me say? Why are you doing? What are you doing? Be able to justify it every single time. And that for me is how we do great hypnosis sessions is to know how we're doing, what we're doing. But the reason why I mentioned Morris and Anna um, in particular was no, neither of them are, are here with us anymore, sadly. But it's about that support that we have. You know, when we have teachers and mentors, it truly isn't just about being taught. It's about where I truly learn to start paying it forward and, and why I do so much to try and support my own students. And when my good friend mentor, uh, a mentor, Morris, passed away, his family asked me to speak at his funeral. And you can imagine that was much scarier than, you know, much scarier even than doing this. And let me tell you, I've been a bit scared about doing this. <laughs> and it was Anna who hypnotised me over the phone and said to me, 
you can do this, you have to do this for Morris. And uh, she hypnotised me over the phone. I didn't think that she was able to make it. She was based down in London. I remember very clearly being stood at the back of the crematorium, looking down at my feet, doing my self-hypnosis, trying to get my stuff together. When interview came, two pointy stilettos, and I looked up, and there was an, army, an Armani suit. She put a hand on my shoulder, handed me a thimble of whiskey. Now, those of you who know me, I'm teetotal. I drank the whiskey. And she looked at me, and she said these words. Sometimes, cows, it takes more than hypnosis. <laughs> and this is very true, isn't it? You know, when we think about our hypnotic community, the one that we have here at HypnoThoughts, it's actually not all about hypnosis. It's about that support. It's about that mentorship. It's about the belief that we have, the belief that we have in each other, the belief that we have in hypnosis and what we can do with it, the way we involve it, we move it forwards. There's so much that happens here in this room and in the corridors. And also, way after that, hypnosis or hypno thoughts is not a three day event. It's a three day conference that then allows us to have these friendships and connections that last forever. You know, some of my Lifelong friends are here tonight in this room who I have met whilst I've been here at Hypno Thoughts. Now, my first Hypno Thoughts was actually uh, seven years ago. This is, I think, my seventh or eighth Hypno Thoughts. I can't quite remember. But, you know, as I've already said, as a result of that, as coming here simply as an attendee, knowing absolutely nobody, came away with a new sense of belief that perhaps I should apply and come and teach the year after. And I nearly talked myself out of it. And on my way home, I was actually sat in Philadelphia airport and started watching some YouTube videos. And it was Bernay Brown's The Power of Vulnerability that came on. And I watched that video and I realized that if I didn't do that, Every single person that I'd worked with in the, in, the, in the realm of sexual freedom hypnosis, I would be letting down if I didn't come and start teaching this stuff. And also, I would have been letting down my mentors, Morris and Anna, who had literally taught me everything that they knew and had done that with such generosity that it was now time for me to kind of start paying that forwards. So that's what I did, as Scott said, you know, I applied, I came back, they gave, me, they gave me a shot, they really didn't know who I was, and it's worked out pretty well. And, you know, it's very easy to think, after that year, that first year, I thought, this is cool, I've got this sussed. And then Karen Hand said to me, Kaz, you need to write a book. I'm dyslexic. I'm like, I can't write a book. Then Shelley Stockwell said to me, Kaz, you need to write a book. <laughs> and I said, I can't do that, Shelley. I'm dyslexic. And she looked at me and she went, rubbish, so am I, and I've written loads. So I thought, damn. <laughs> but I didn't know quite how to do it. And that was the next kind of thing that I made, was there again some more amazing mentors that I've discovered here at Hypno Thoughts. And in this case, it was Richard Nongard. I, I discovered his course, How to write, or write a Book with Richard. And I enlisted on his course, and off we went, and I wrote a book. It's write a book in 12 weeks. It took me twice as long as that, but I got there in the end. And thank you. And we published it, which was kind of cool. Except there was a problem. And the problem was that the Amazon algorithm saw, saw my title, which was called How to Find, Understand, and Embrace Your Sexual Pleasure. And on the inside was a biological diagram. And somehow the Amazon kind of algorithms and robots took kind of real kind of horror at that and decided it was erotic and improper and all kinds of stuff. So suddenly I found myself 
in the same position my ancestor Jay and Barry was a hundred years prior fighting the censors. But I had all of these people there behind me. I would have all these people behind me that believed in me, even though I wasn't sure that I could take that on. And, you know, I remember Richard in particular messaging me saying, this is bullshit, you have to find them. Don't you dare change that book, get on with it. And lots of other people in this room like, no, Kaz, you fight it. We know you can do it. So I did. I took, them, I took on Amazon. And at first, I just kind of, you know, complained and told them that they needed to change it. And they were having none of it, absolutely none of it. In fact, at one point, they told me that they were going to ban this book completely. And I thought there must be a way. So for two days, I trawled the internet. I'm thinking, I'm going to find out how you contact Jeff Bezos. <laughs> and there were a couple of people that said to me, you're going to what? <laughs> and I said, I'm going to contact Jeff Bezos. And believe it or not, I found his email address. And I also found um, there was an urban legend that if you could grab his attention, he would forward whatever email had been sent with a question mark to the relevant department and they'll be on it like that. And I thought to myself, a man that's just sent a rocket into the sky that looks like a penis probably isn't that interested in female sexuality. <laughs> So I took a slightly different tack. <laughs> and the strap line for my, for my email to Jeff Bezos was this. Malfunctioning algorithm causing discrimination at Amazon. And it caught his attention. And after nearly two months of being absolutely blocked by Amazon, suddenly at 3 a.m. my phone went. And it was the uh, executive for KDP saying, we're gonna sort this out, Mr. Bezos has, asked, has asked to do this. Right. And 12 hours later, my book was available on Amazon. Now, can you imagine if I'd faked that? I had to believe it to achieve it, yeah? <laughs> so, believe it or not, being a, a talker, I'm not, I'm not gonna talk for too much longer. But what I am going to do is just remind you of a few things, and that is this, that in this room, not only do you have some of the most amazing hypnosis educators in the world, and some of the most giving hypnosis educators in the world, but also to remind you, my first time here, the real inspiration came from other first-timers. It was other first-timers that were telling me, you need to come back here next year and teach. It was HypnoThoughts that gave me a shot when nobody else would, who took on a risque subject when nobody else would, who believed in me when I didn't really believe in myself. In this room, there is so much imagination, inspiration, belief, and people that will celebrate your success. You can see that here tonight. You know, I, I really feel privileged to be here. So on the tables, you might have noticed that there's some badges. And one of the things that my old mum used, my, my, when we were learning to fly and she was teaching me how to fly, was I asked her once when she had to learn how to fly, and it was when she trained to be a nurse. And tonight I wear her nursing badges. This is what I've got of my, of my mum now. These were the badges that she got. And I look at these badges often to remind, me, to, my, to remind myself to believe in myself. And often if I'm having a down day or I've had a bad client session or you know, Amazon are refusing to publish a book, I'll go and look at these badges and it reminds me to be resilient, to have self-belief, to 
to know that even if at some point I don't believe in myself, there was always that time when my mum believed in me that I could read when I truly didn't believe that I could. So on the tables, I have placed lots of badges. And these badges are there to remind you that you are part of the Hypno Thoughts community, that you are an inspiration and you can be inspired, that you have imagination. And within our clients, we, we, we inspire their imaginations, we fire their imaginations every single day. That you can celebrate your success. It's perfectly okay to celebrate our success and to share in others. And within these rooms, these walls, these corridors, there are amazing opportunities if you have the courage to take them. But more than anything is to know that you can have self-belief. And if you're lacking in that at the moment, for whatever reason, there are people in abundance in this room that will believe in you until you have the courage to believe in yourself. And it's to remember that we are hypnotists. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, and one other thing, one other thing. Should you need it, Jeff Bezos' email address is <laughs> Jeff at Amazon.com. <laughs> <laughs>